Uh, thank you all for joining us. And this is another in our series of sharing information from people who participated in our Summer Scholars Program last year. Uh, obviously, it was not the in-person experience that we really would have liked and had Tom and Colin among our midst walking around and getting to know them in person. Uh, but they were doing some really interesting work around what was called the Iowa Small Towns Project and data that Tom, I know, has been familiar with for a long time. If you're not familiar, Colin Lewis Beck is a visiting assistant professor in statistics and actuarial science. And Tom Rice is a professor in political science and also uh, recently has become a distinguished research fellow in the Public Policy Center in our politics and policy research program, uh, working with Tracy Osborne and, and that group. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Tom and Colin to talk about the work they did this summer. Thank you guys both. Uh, thanks, Pete, and thanks to the Public Policy Center. Um, thank you for the grant uh, that allowed us to do this work. Uh, Colin and I had a good time working together and it was nice to get to know him. Uh, there's a little side story there, which um, I think is, is, is worth telling. Colin's father, uh, Mike Lewis Beck, was my dissertation advisor at Iowa. Uh, many, many, many years ago. So it's really uh, fun for me to, to be able to work with Colin now and stay in touch with Mike too, obviously. We've stayed close over the years. Uh, so Colin, thanks for working with me. Your father should have warned you. Uh, <laughs> but Mike and, I, Mike and I did a lot of work together when I was getting my degree and shortly thereafter. Uh, so it's nice to work with another Louis Beck. Uh, the project that we're gonna talk about is um, one that uses a data set that I first got introduced to when I taught at Iowa State for a few years in the mid 90s. And I used it for an awful lot of research uh, and then sort of set it aside as I got involved in other things and then went into central administration. But now that I'm back teaching, it was neat to get reconnected with these data. Um, and I wanna spend a couple of minutes talking about these data uh, before we jump right into our project. So let me share the screen here if I can. So we should all be seeing a PowerPoint here. Whoops. And our project is called Closed Versus Open Leadership in Small Iowa Towns. And the data we're using is from an ISU study that started in 1994. And it was repeated in 2004 and 2014, and it's going to be repeated again in 2024. And this project involved um, 99 small Iowa towns, one per county. And what Iowa State did was they put all the towns in each county with a population between 500 and 10,000 in a small bucket and drew one, and that was the town. So we've got towns spread across the state and they're small towns. Uh, they then did a random sample survey of adults in those towns. And we average about 80 adults per town, some slightly more, some slightly uh, less. And they've done that in 94, 2004, and 2014. Different adults, so it's not a panel study. Uh, we're going to use the 2014 data because this survey included some questions that the others didn't, although there's been a number of questions that have been asked the same over the three waves. Um, the questionnaire, uh, which has remained, like I said, largely the same, they've substituted some questions in and out, and we're going to use some that are unique to 2014, asks a number of questions to these 80 adults in each town. Uh, they ask about the quality of town amenities, like the shopping and the medical services. They ask, they ask about the quality of government services, everything from fire service to parks and so forth. There's also a large number of questions about people's perceptions of their town, the extent to which they think their town is friendly and trusting and safe, and, and on and on. There's just a, a, a wide range of questions about how people perceive their town. And then there's also questions about each person's involvement in their, in their town. What activities are they involved in? There's a long list of groups that you could belong to in your town. How many do you belong to? How often do you volunteer? How do you volunteer? Uh, do you go to church? Uh, a whole range of questions about how active you are in town activities. There's also a number of questions about, I would call it neighborliness, the extent to which you interact with your neighbors, how well you know your neighbors. 
Uh, and then there's just another, another battery of questions about friends generally. How many of your friends live in town? How many live out of town? So these are the types of questions that are asked of the folks in these towns. And then there's a few others as well. Um, the, this is a map and this shows you where these towns are. Uh, it's a little hard to read here in Johnson County, the town that was selected was Hills. Um, over in uh, Iowa County is Williamsburg, uh, Montezuma over in Powashik and so forth. So there's your town spread all across the state. Uh, there's been a number, not just a number, there's been a ton of studies using these data. Everything from articles published in the very best journals in the social sciences down to all kinds of undergraduate papers written. And they are on a range of topics, so one of which will intersect our work and that's social capital. We'll talk more about that in a second. I've done a lot of work with these data looking at social capital. Um, community attachment, the extent to which people are attached to their communities, why some communities have people more attached than others, what kinds of people are attached. Uh, questions about economic development, what kinds of towns seem to be able to uh, pull in um, economic development, which is tough in these small Iowa towns. Uh, ethnic diversity and the impact that has on towns. This is a particularly interesting area because these towns are almost all white. Uh, but we still found, and some of this is my work, that towns that were ethnically diverse in terms of their whiteness, the Norwegians and Germans and Italians and English, the more diverse a town is, actually the less social capital it had. Uh, so interesting findings. Um, volunteerism, a lot of work around that, a lot of it having to do with town upkeep. Uh, we've done some supplementary work, some work I did, sent somebody out one summer to all 99 towns to assess town upkeep. They did a long questionnaire uh, as they drove around town, filling out information about Main Street and the parks and so forth. So we've done a lot of work about what kind of towns are best kept. Uh, our study takes a look at some new questions in the survey and it has to do with how open or closed uh, citizens' perceptions of their community leadership is. Um, added in 2014 for the first time, they had two uh, seven point scales were added uh, to measure, measure the extent to which leadership in the towns was perceived as open or closed. Um, we don't have any objective measures of how open or closed it is, although you could get those with some time and some energy. Uh, so respondents were asked where the leadership in their town fell on a couple of seven point scales, one running to leadership's very concentrated, tightly held to very dispersed, and the other running from leadership is very exclusive to leadership is very inclusive. Uh, and those the, both those can be thought of as ranging kind of from closed to open leadership. To what extent um, is the leadership in a town open to a lot of people participating? And to what degree is it closed? Maybe a, like a good old boys network, we might think of it that way. So we took both those skills and since they're both measuring roughly the same thing, they were very highly correlated. People's responses were very highly correlated. And we created one uh, scale. Uh, to measure respondents' answers to the essentially the openness of uh, leadership in their town, open to other people participating, a wide range of people participating, or is your leadership more closed? Uh, that drives our research question. We're asking what determines people's perceptions of whether local leadership is open or closed? Why does, and there's variation across the towns. Uh, some towns have citizens who feel their leadership is relatively closed, other towns feel as their leadership is relatively open. Uh, and of course, it varies by person too. People in, in towns have very different opinions about the uh, openness or closeness, if you will, of the leadership of their town. We are driven by one primary hypothesis with some competing ones to put it to a test. And that is that uh, whether a town's leadership is perceived as open or closed will be driven in large part by the extent to which a town has what we call social capital. Uh, many of us know what that is. And it's defined somewhat differently by different scholars. Uh, it was made popular for political scientists by a book called Making Democracy Work by Robert Putnam back in the mid 90s, early 90s. Uh, and we worked with that concept before, 
but uh, Putnam really brought it to the forefront. Uh, prior to him, it might have been called civic culture, civic engagement. Uh, he, he used the term social capital, which wasn't unique to him, but it, it caught on, the book caught on. And what that book does is um, does a pretty clear job of, for political scientists anyway, defining what social capital is comprised of. And it's made up of two components in, in uh, most definitions, including Bob Putnam's. One is a high level of interpersonal trust. So a society where people trust each other, uh, even though they might not know each other, there's just, just a kind of a pervasive sense of trust in your fellow humans, uh, that would be a society high in social capital. And you can also measure social capital obviously at the individual level, somebody who trusts those around him or her would be somebody who you perceive as having at least high social capital in that dimension. The other dimension is uh, getting things done as a group for the benefit of um, not necessarily only yourself. So coming together to accomplish um, a common good, uh, cooperating to get things done. Uh, that's sort of the other component of social capital as defined by Bob Putnam and is used by political scientists since the uh, 90s. So we're, um, excuse me, Bob Putnam found that social capital in Italy varied dramatically from north to south. And it was the single best ex explainer, or explanatory variable for the quality of government and that varied north to south. Governments in the north were was high in social capital, the governments up there were more efficient, they're more efficient, effective, they're more responsive. Government just ran better uh, in a society where social capital was strong. And, and you know, that makes some sense. And then in southern Italy, where social capital is noticeably lower, uh, governments were much less effective, rarely responsive, not at all efficient in many cases. Uh, so you had this wide variation in, in the country of Italy, and that let, sparked a lot of research looking at a connection between social capital and the quality of democracy elsewhere around the globe. And I took that, uh, excuse me, first of all, it's silent, however, on whether government is more open. So it's, you could perceive, you, you could imagine a government that's relatively closed, run by a small circle of people that was still very efficient and effective and responsive. Uh, and Putnam says nothing about the extent to which government is open or closed. It's all about the quality of the services uh, that come out of those governments to meet citizen needs. Uh, a lot of work's been done on this in other settings. I did some work back in the early 2000s using these data, um, looking at small Iowa towns. And there was variation in social capital across these towns. And what we found was that Iowa towns with higher social capital did have better functioning governments, uh, both in terms of people's perceptions of what they were getting from government, they rated the quality of services and the quality of um, uh, the various um, activities the government does. But we also had some objective measures of government and those too were related to the level of social capital in the town. So controlling for lots of other things, social capital is the primary driver of the quality of government, uh, both per in perception and objectively in these small Iowa towns. Uh, so we can run right by this here. But again, my study back then was silent on whether good government is more open. So are those towns that are high in social capital and have better functioning governments, are those governments that are more open, allowing more citizens to participate, maybe a wider range of citizens to participate, we were able, unable to say anything about that because we didn't have any data to address that question. And that's where our work comes in. So measuring social capital, uh, we have a, a rich array of questions. And that's one of the, the purposes of the status set back in 94 was to uh, look at social capital in these small Iowa towns. That was one of the driving forces between the, behind the research team at Iowa State. So we have a seven point trust scale that's been used over and over again from these data where people are asked on a seven point scale, how trusting or not trusting or, uh, is my town. And uh, it's, it's found to be a very good indicator of interpersonal trust. Um, 
stacks up well uh, in a variety of tests that we've done over the years. So as we're pretty sure we've got a good indication of the trust dimension of social capital with this seven point scale where people are placed their town on this scale of trusting to not trusting. And when it comes to getting things done, we take a look at two questions. One is a five point scale that has to do more with when people come to help you. If you had trouble in your town, if you had an emergency, will there be people to help you? And this is one form of, of cooperation. It's coming together to help somebody, not you, you get nothing out of it, but coming together to help somebody else in your town in a time of need. Uh, social capital cooperation can also be thought of as the town coming together to accomplish some good. So there's another five point scale that asks respondents when something needs to get done, the whole town gets behind it. You know, strongly agree, agree, middle, strongly disagree, or mildly disagree, strongly disagree. So we have unconfident, very good measures of social capital from these towns and the citizens in those towns. We can aggregate up and get measures of social capital by town, or we can disaggregate and get measures of social capital by individuals. So we're about ready to turn over to Colin here. We're, this sort of drives our research is that social capital should be related to the extent to which people perceive their town's leadership to be open or closed. Our hypothesis is that social capital is going to be related to towns being open, perceptions of leadership being open in those towns, uh, that leadership is diverse, that it's inclusive, brings people together. And towns lower in social capital will have lower levels of um, well, perceptions of open and inclusive leadership. Now, it's possible that other things are driving people's perceptions of leadership in their towns. And we test a whole range of social demographics. You can imagine, for example, that um, women in some towns might perceive leadership as being more closed, especially if the leadership in those towns is, is still a group of older men that run that town. Or it could be young people who aren't yet really in a position to assume leadership might perceive leadership as being closed. They might kind of want to participate, but there's are just not taken seriously by others, or it could be uh, the less educated, feel as though towns kind of run by the country club group and that they really don't have much say. So we test a wide range of social demographic variables and uh, assess whether those uh, drive people's perception of whether their local leadership is open or closed. So that kind of sets up the research. Uh, it's a pretty quantitative study, and I'm lucky to have a good statistician to work with. My skills are rusty and um, have not been kept up to date. So I've learned a few things uh, from Colin in this process. Uh, so Colin, I think at this point, we turn it over to you. Great, thanks, Tom. Um, yeah, so uh, this is, uh, I'm, I'm gonna continue here and talk a little bit about the methodology and uh, some of the results we've found um, so far testing these hypotheses that, hypotheses that Tom uh, laid out. Um, and so first, here's just a distribution. Um, actually, let's look at some data. So this is um, our uh, power perception uh, measure that we've constructed, as Tom mentioned, out of these two, um, two variables. And uh, we can see there's a, you know, this ranges from, uh, you know, one to 14, where 14 would be, um, right, your town is, is, is power is, is extremely concentrated, um, and then going to the left-hand side, uh, less, less concentrated. And there's there's definitely variability. Um, so these are this is a distribution of the individuals individual scores across these 99 towns. So um, we think there's enough variation here that you know we can't estimate or test some of these hypotheses. So um, even though these towns are homogeneous in some respects, we do see some differences across um, this uh, power perception um, variable. Um, and right in the center, I guess as you would expect, maybe you know it's not totally symmetric. People are leaning a little bit more towards saying their town is is towards the more open side than, than towards the closed side. Um, and right in the center around seven uh, is the midpoint where we see most of the, uh, the mass of the data. Um, Tom, do you wanna to go to the next slide here for me? So uh, one thing um, that we don't have, unfortunately, is an, an objective measure of, of the distribution of power. So um, 
we are relying on citizens, um, you know, responding to the survey. It'd be nice if we, I mean, in these small towns, we tried to think about ways you could sort of objectively or, you know, outside of this data say, set validate whether how accurate these perceptions me measures are. Um, and well, one thing we thought about perhaps as a way to validate this is to say, well, what about the people that are, um, what's the correlation or how, how associated are the perceptions of power for people who are um, sort of part of the elite in the in the town versus um, sort of average, average everyday citizens? Um, are those picking up the same, are those roughly correlated in a way that, um, you know, we can say that these citizens across the board are, are you know, accurately, you know, capturing what, you know, the power concentration in their town. Um, and so this is what we have here. So we, we came up, we were with a measure of um, sort of in, being a lead or maybe more tied into the community. So you would be able to have a better idea of how power is dispersed in the town um, by looking at people that were either had been appointed um, to either an elected, an elected position or some sort of appointed position that could be to a, you know, an appointed position in a, uh, the Elks Club or, you know, uh, some sort of uh, higher up position in the uh, town. And then we looked at then people that hadn't been. So one of the survey questions we have is, you know, how many elected positions have you um, been, have you won or how many appointed positions do you have in the community? Um, and if you look at just, you know, look at most people, I mean, it's, it's around 25% or a little under 25, 20% or so people have had some sort of leadership type position. Um, as opposed to these other this other group, which we defined as just you, you zero, right? You haven't been elected or to an appointed position, um, and those seem to correlate. So and so this scatter plot here is just showing, um, and you know, hopefully if those things right were perfectly, you know, you know we're never going to see a correlation of one, but we would like to see a relatively you know strong correlation between those two measures, um, and we looked at these separately for large towns and small towns, thinking that we would expect. Uh, that correlation to be stronger in small towns where people um, do know more of the people in the community, they're better tied to what's going on in the, at the city council or other um, you know, local organizations. And that correlation is around 0.63 for small towns, which we def defined as smaller, you know, less than a thousand people. Um, and unsurprisingly, when we looked at the larger towns, these were over a thousand people. Uh, we still see, you know, for social science data, it's a, I would say that's still a pretty decently sized correlation, but is it is less than than for those um, small towns. So this was more just a stepping stone just to see um, if there was consistency in this um, perception of a power measure. Um, Tom, you want to go to the next slide here. Um, so here's the model that we uh, specified to test these hypotheses. And uh, we came up with a multi level or sometimes hierarchical model is, is what these are described as. Uh, which is reflects the structure of the data. Uh, we want the model to be consistent with that structure of the data where we have individuals um, that are nested within towns. Um, and so we should have a model that uh, represents these multiple levels. Um, and so we just start identifying here. Um, so I from one through N denotes the individual respondents of the surveys. We have J in indexing the towns. So we had 99 towns here. Um, and then we have uh, individual covariates, so these would be the socio-demographic and social capital variables that Tom had mentioned. And we also wanted to control too for, um, at the town level, uh, town population size. So um, holding that constant, uh, you know, do these um, other hypotheses still hold. So we the, the top level here, this is our, our YI here, is the um, sort of, or sorry, I mean the bottom level here where we have an intercept, our of, you know, matrix here of uh, controls, hypothesis that we're testing. Um, and then we have our, uh, the intercept is going to come up in the town level population. So we'll control within a given town, um, the population. And then um, in the, to complete our hierarchical model, we have the coefficients, our beta J's are coming from, uh, we're gonna assume a normal distribution. Um, so we'll be able to get a, you know, a town level parameter estimate uh, for our hypotheses, as well as a distribution for um, the overall average across all the towns. And um, we took a Bayesian approach to estimation, um, it, which pairs nicely with this hierarchical modeling framework. Um, and we do have a lots of data, so we could be pretty weak with in terms of the priors we specified on these unknown parameters. Uh, we were able to put very diffuse priors um, and um, get posterior distributions that were um, well behaved. 
So um, we did use Markov chain Monte Carlo, um, estimated our model here. Um, and Tom, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, and so here are the um, some results that we were able to um, get. And these are, again, uh, credible intervals for the town level mean parameters. So these are the, that you can think of these as um, uh, intervals for the average of all of the 99 coefficients for each of these uh, independent variables that we put into our model. And we've, we tried, we have three different specification here, specifications here. Um, the first one is what we're calling the SES mo uh, model, or we have these socio-demographic characteristics. Uh, we have the social capital model, um, which is the other piece that Tom had outlined in our um, sort of overall model structure. And then we um, wanted to put those order, sort of put both of those models together, um, saturated model where we test jointly um, the effect of these uh, various covariates. Um, and uh, so, and then the, the, so the first variable here, this is our overall, this is controlling for town population. Um, and one thing to note is that uh, all of these, the, the dependent and independent variables, we standardize all of those so we can um, compare effect sizes and think about these as a, uh, in terms of standard effective standard deviation. So a one unit um, increase in standard deviation for our X, these are giving us the relative standard deviation change in Y, our perception of power variable. Um, and uh, looking here at our first model, our SES model, um, uh, we see that uh, perhaps maybe unsurprisingly, the age uh, is going to, the older you are in the town, right, the more uh, open you believe that your, the, the leadership is in your town. So a negative sign here, again, remember, the lower the number on our Y scale means your perception of power is more inclusive or diffuse. Um, uh, surprising, so education really, um, if we think about doing a hypothesis test uh, with, with zero here, does, it does not really have much effect. Um, uh, income and, and how long you have lived in the town, again, uh, perhaps not uh, surprising that they were going to lead you to be, have, believe that the town is, is more open. Um, uh, gender variable here, so this was a dummy variable for, for female. Um, again, not quite um, you know, uh, significant. Our credible interval here does cover zero. Um, but more surprising, I guess we were looking here, if we look at the, you know, how much variability we're actually able to explain in this, our dependent variable, our perception of power um, outcome, right, very little, right, our R squared is, is 0.02. So, um, you know, some of these effects here are, are significant. We have, right, quite a number of observations for, you know, for over 4,400 individuals overall in 99 towns. Um, so it's not surprising that we would, you know, find some effect sizes, but in terms of the magnitude, they're pretty, um, pretty trivial compared to when we look here at the um, social capital model, um, where we can see uh, these um, individual and community support variables um, that Tom had mentioned in terms of people willing to help you out at an individual level, if you were in an emergency, if your car broke down, um, does the community, um, you know, are people allowed to contribute to local affairs at the community level? Um, and then the trust question here was, uh, as Tom had mentioned, a scale of tr the town being um, one being, you know, you, it's very trusting to seven being not trusting. Um, so as the that you that trust variable increases, that you people feel that there's less trust in the town, um, power, um, you know, the concentration increases there. Um, and these are much larger. We can see we're explaining a lot more of the variation too when we go from just the socio demographics to our social capital model. Uh, we can get R squared jumps up to 0.35. So this is, you know, doing a lot uh, stronger job at explaining um, these variations across R99 uh, towns. And then finally, we, we uh, jointly modeled both, both the SES and social capital uh, variables. Um, these are pretty orthogonal to each other. The coefficients don't really change uh, barely at all when we jointly model these, um, you know, these community and individual support uh, variables are not that very weakly correlated with these other variables. So the model is pretty stable even when we um, combine these into this joint model here in um, our third column right here. And we can still see we again where our R squared remains the same at around 0.35. Um, so uh, I think next slide, Tom. Um, so uh, just some, uh, we're, we're still working on putting the, the paper together here, um, but uh, I was surprised myself, and, and Tom's worked at this data more than I, than I have, just how um, much uh, stronger our social capital measures were in terms of um, explaining 
uh, why leadership is more closed or open in these communities. And you know, as there is more trust and there's more um, individuals and community support within the community, um, that that results in, in um, more diffuse perceptions of power um, across these towns, especially in terms of when we compare it to the SES variables, which um, if Tom, if you want to click one more here, um, sort of a null finding. I mean, they really have very, even though there, are, there is uh, considerable variability in these demographic, some of these demographic and socioeconomic factors um, within our sample of these 99 towns, they really seem to not uh, play much of a role in um, our uh, perception of power um, independent variable or dependent variable. Um, and then finally, something that we're still working on is uh, so, you know, as Tom had mentioned, this new, this is a new question, this social, um, this leadership, um, these leadership, battery of leadership questions that was only added in our latest 2014 survey. Um, it'd be nice if we had had them from earlier surveys because, right, that we would clearly sort of have an exogenous relationship where we could look at, say, these, um, you know, uh, social capital variables in, at, in 2004 or 2010 and see what the effect on our leadership variables in 2014. Um, there is a, a little bit of a question that we, Tom and I have been wrestling with just if, I mean, I, if, in terms of um, making the argument, you know, that, that being certain that these, we do have a, a causal relationship here where um, these social capital variables are clearly pointing towards um, leadership. And, and theoretically there's, there's um, belief that this is true, but we're, you know, we like to also try and test this uh, with our data as well. So that's something uh, that we're also uh, working on at the moment. Um, so I think that's uh, our, our talk and we can open it now, Tom, unless there's anything else you wanna say, we can open it up to questions um, from folks. And um, so thank you. That's good, Paul, well, thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, we'll take questions. Um, and before, uh, I'll make sure I make a plug for the data. Anybody who wants to use these data, they really are terrific. And there's been a whole lot of things added to the basic uh, survey data. So you've got uh, just a, a, an amazingly rich data set on these uh, 99 small Iowa towns. Uh, some really unusual, interesting findings. But, and just one real quick off the uh, subject just a bit. It, we have good measures of town upkeep from the surveys that were done on site. And what we found was the towns that had been visited by RAGBRA in the last five years were somewhat better looking, a little bit better kept. Uh, so I don't think Ragbri is choosing which town to go through based on upkeep, uh, although that might be a little bit of it, but I think towns are choosing to spruce themselves up knowing that Ragbri will be coming through. So that's just an aside of how rich and interesting these data are on, the, on these small Iowa towns. Okay, Tracy. Hey, it's a big day when I learned how to raise my hand on Zoom. Uh, so I thought this was really interesting. Um, I read Making Democracy Burke back in grad school, and that was the last time I read it. So it's been a while. Uh, but I had basically two questions. Um, one was, what do open and closed mean? Um, I sort of got as you were talking what you were talking about, but you never really defined what open and closed meant. And it became clear to me later on that you meant if the person perceived them to be open or closed and not necessarily if the town really was open or closed. Um, and then the second question I had was sort of a, a follow up to it, which is I would imagine that not just the characteristics of the, the respondent would determine open or closeness, reception of open and closeness, but the characteristics of who is actually on the town government, you know, and not just its structure. Um, so for instance, if your government, well, I study women in politics, obviously, so this will be my example, but if your government was all male, right, then women, you know, I noticed you had a significant gender effect, you know, women would probably perceive it as, um, as not very open to them. Um, and so if you want to do the second question, I'm happy to work with you, <laughs> but if like, I think it's kind of maybe a different paper, but, um, I guess what I, what I would encourage you to do, I haven't read the paper, but is to be more specific about what open and closed mean. 
um, and kind of put that in the front of the presentation so that it's a bit clearer, you know, because I've read the book and I wasn't in, even remembering necessarily what open and close meant. Well, that's fair enough. In the book, you know, actually, Bob doesn't talk about open and closed. And that's one of the, um, Bob talks about the quality, Bob Putnam, the quality of the government services that are provided. All I remember about that book was thinking he's a genius because he got to travel all over Italy and write that book. And like, that was my goal yeah. as a grad student. It was like, how can I do that? Yeah, yeah, well, he is a genius for a lot of reasons, but yes, he did get to travel all over Italy. Um, yes, by we are locked into the data itself, the question that was asked. And that question, and I can pull it out right here. It, um, it says local leadership plays an important role in how a town addresses social and economic issues. Please tell us about leadership in your community using the pair of words below. Imagine a scale for each pair of words. Uh, the first pair one means that uh, on the scale indicates a town that is very inclusive in its leadership and a seven very exclusive in its leadership. It does the same thing then for concentrated and um, dispersed. And then it has some other measures that have nothing to do with open or closed. So that's a good question, Tracy. And I, th I, th I think what these are getting at and the extent to which people feel as though those who run the community, running the community is relatively open to a variety of people. That it's not just four or five or seven or 10 people who kind of make decisions behind closed doors, but instead it's an open process where they themselves may not participate, but they feel as though, you know, their pastor has input and um, their, their son's teacher who they've gotten to be good friends with seems to have some input. Um, so that's, I think, what's, what's being captured here in these two scales. Um, but that's where we'd like to have an objective measure of how open that government is. Um, and that would be a challenge, but I think you could do it. And it certainly has been done in previous community power studies from the 70s and 60s and 50s, all with larger communities, but putting, putting together lists of people who are perceived by others as in a position of some influence. And if the list is big and broad, then that's a town where leadership is somewhat dispersed. If it seems to be the same people who show up on everybody's list as the power brokers, then it's a more concentrated leadership. On your second question, it would be very interesting to compare some of these things to the extent to which, and you can measure this pretty easily, the percentage of the city councils that are women. Now, the city councils are mostly five people. Some of these towns are seven. So, you know, there's going to be a lot of error, kind of a lot of noise going on. But there are some towns where there, nowadays, there are towns, some towns where everybody is a woman, all five council people. Others, of course, are all men. Then uh, that would be, that would give you gender diversity, at least. In, who sits, who sits on the council. But we all know, also know that power is much more than just the council. It's the economic leaders. It might be the religious leaders. Um, and those, I mean, you could get it, it would be, you'd be digging. And it's 99 towns, so it's not easy to put it together. So we're, we're relying entirely on perceptions. Colin, I'm monopolizing here. Yep, uh, um, so yeah. Uh, Lucy, it looks like she, you raised your hand next here. Um. Yeah, hi. So I have a couple of questions and I'm, I'm trying to make them useful to you because I know you're limited by your data. But first, I, to me, there's one piece I would have loved to hear is the impact of local political ideology, which you can have because you know how many people voted or percent voted for Trump or even voted for Obama in 08, which a lot of Iowa towns did. And I think that could be an important information in terms of you know, supplementing the, the idea of openness and inclusivity, like how how 100% pro-Trump versus how, um, you know, the town ebbs and flow over time. I think that would be another measure that you can get. Um, if I think about what I think about our government here in Iowa City and my, versus my friends, right, it seems to me that I see it as very open because I've been part of commissions and groups and, right, 
And I have plenty of friends with the equal, same equal education, same town, right? They've been here even longer, who will say this is a very closed town because they've never, they've never been on. They haven't run for office. They haven't been on a commission, right? So the individual's respondents, whether they have been on government in any function, whether, you know, commission, volunteer board, or elected, seem to me that would be a very, very important determinant to have. And you can get that, right? I mean, you can probably, I, 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 I don't know how you have the anonymity set up, right? But you can see whether anybody has ever been elected official or volunteer on a board. That would take more time, right? And maybe some undergrad labor, but these are open records. You can find who was on every commission. Uh, to me, that would be a really important factor to look on, right? So those who are at some point involved in government probably believe it's open. And those yeah, that's a good uh, point, Lucy. We did look at, um, to your political ideology question. So we, yeah, we have party identification, you know, Republican, Democrat, or independent. And we constructed a variable thinking that the idea, like maybe what you're saying is that if you're in a town that's, you know, uh, you know, 85% Republican and you're in the minority party um, or vice versa, if you're, you know, in Hills, which is a much more heavily democratic town and you're a Republican. So we constructed a variable sort of like we defined as sort of not in the majority politically, um, would you affect your perceptions of power. Um, and it didn't end up having any effect in our model, which was surprising because we figured that that might um, be an important thing. Uh, but um, yeah, this, so the idea of the, uh, the elected thing is another good, I mean, in terms of being, um, I guess, as a higher member of a society, someone more involved in the community is, is definitely also something we should explore. And here's one more before I leave, I leave that to everybody else. But the, my understanding of differences between Protestant denominations and, and, and not being an I one, it's hard for me to figure out. But but my understanding is that the main difference is how pastors are nominated, whether they're elected by the community or named from another institution outside outside the locality, right? And so the denomination that's dominant, if that's okay to say, might be really important as well, right? And I wouldn't, I, I can't say whether Methodists are like this and Lutherans are like that because I really don't know. But my understanding is that they have very different ways of, of identifying their leadership. And maybe a church where the denomination or the congregation comes together to select their next pastor is also one maybe the way that's more likely to feel that governor is open versus one where the denomination you're in just sends you a pastor from the outside. You might see, see power as something more closed. I, it's something else you might want to explore. And I, I really, I'm not an expert at all, but I, I think that might make a difference. Yeah, I, we, in fact, we do have in the survey religion is, is asked, and that just goes again to the richness of these data. Uh, so we we have done work, there has been work done on the extent of which a town that is principally one religion, I'm thinking in Iowa, we have several towns that are pretty much Dutch, the Dutch reformist church. Those towns tend to have so higher social capital. My guess is it would probably also be towns where people feel as though their perception is the government's open. In a town where you have German Catholics versus, you know, English Protestants, we know those towns have lower social capital and there could well be towns that also, of course, have a sense that government's not too inclusive. I mean, somebody's in a position of power, they're running it, and it's hard to get hard to get on to that. Um, or in, involved in that, uh, in that town. So good, very good. Thanks. Uh, Mark, I think you were, had your hand up. Yep, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Thanks. I really enjoyed it, Tom, Colin. This was very interesting. I am a non political scientist and know very little about what you, the, the substantive uh, literature your studies based in. I just have a question as a member of the public, but also someone who thinks about community health. Um, so how, how can your findings help people like me to understand kind of the, the struggle and um, kind of ongoing economic and civic, uh, for lack of a better word, decay that we witness and see in some of our Western Iowa and Southern Iowa communities? Um, what does this mean? What is this what, are these, what does this variation mean? Can we look at communities and can we map these differences onto these communities and will that help us understand these kind of long-term trends that seem to be instigated or have been instigated by the, for instance, the farm crisis of the eighties? And maybe maybe not, maybe, maybe my kind of 
the, the lens I'm using to understand the meaning of the findings is totally misplaced. Well, Mark, that's, uh, that's a good question. And um, I, we, we can certainly, you know, we have some information. I think, and you're somewhat familiar with these data, I think. I think you're, you're working with um, Iowa State a bit on these data. A little bit, yeah, not much. But I remember them from the 90s when Terry Besser. Right. Well, Terry is one that introduced me to the data. She was, yeah. She's wonderful. Um, so we do have, of course, objective indicators of the uh, health of the economy in these towns. We can trace that over time. Um, that's, that's government data. We also have uh, perceptions of uh, people's, I think, I think there's some questions in the survey about people's perceptions of the economic health of their town. Uh, but, but here again, we have objective measures. Um, I don't, you know, I don't, some of these towns have suffered dramatically. I think that's what you're getting at from the farm crisis and other crises. You know, the one industry in town leaves. Uh, somebody had a plastics plant and they left and it just decimates the town. I, it'd be interesting to look at the extent to which that affects people's perceptions of the quality of their government and the openness of the government. I don't know what the answer would be, but that'd be that be an independent variable we could throw in you know, the economic yeah. health of the town. One thing yeah. that, that's interesting though too, um, Mark, is I agree, right? you know, these towns, you, you drive around Iowa and you see there's nothing, the main street's all closed up, right? There's maybe just a Casey's on the street, but it, surprisingly the, when you, the, you know, there's a bunch of questions about uh, quality of community services, uh, entertainment, uh, you know, downtown economic health. And I mean, again, these are perceptions questions, but they are, shockingly stable too across from 94 to 04 to 14 which very much surprised me given given what you see or at least I feel like I see when you go to a lot of these small towns the only sort of sign I see or sign we see variable of, of consistent decline over this 20 year plus period that seems to map what you're saying in terms of the economic downturn of these towns is there is a question about would you be sorry to leave the town if if and and that is the one variable we see where people um, are more are, are less sorry to leave and that has consistently dropped over the three waves of the survey um, so there, there is some discontentment or at least that we see in the data but I'm not sure, I don't have a great explanation why, but when you look at some of these other measures about um, you know, community services, uh, the downtown, they, those are pretty flat. And I don't know if that's just a town pride thing or if you, you know, they don't get a lot of new folks in or you've been living there for a long time, you're content with how the status quo is. But um, that, that is, I mean, that's, that's something I would have expected to see more in the data that, that doesn't show up, which is, which is surprising. Yeah, no, this, this is very interesting. Um... I think a lot about our small towns and how they've changed. And I just think that here on campus um, or even at Iowa State, we should do more as social scientists to conduct kind of an autopsy of the, you know, the, the changing environment of these communities and, and what that means for civic life in Iowa and elsewhere. But, but I think what you're doing is getting close. So you know, thanks, I appreciate yeah. it. Well, Mark, I agree with you. I, mean, I think we have a serious problem with small towns and not just Iowa, but across much of the country. And the question, you know, the question is what to do about this sort of consistent decay in these towns in terms of the quality of life, the income, uh, job opportunities. Um, we're not gonna be able to save them all. I mean, in, in some ways, if we were designing Iowa from scratch, we wouldn't put a town every eight miles, which is kind of how far apart they are, kind of on average, because we don't ride horses anymore. Uh, so it doesn't really make any sense for these towns to be, for all these towns to be out there right now. Uh, but, but I mean, who is in favor of closing towns down? That's not a very popular position to take, but um, it's, a, it's a challenge. Uh, Ethan? Yeah, thanks, Tom and Colin. Um, my question, so come, the li limited knowledge I have on social capital is coming from the criminology discipline. And one of the kind of the bigger topics in that that's kind of emerging, I've seen it in health as well as the dark side of social capital. Um, and some people have kind of been looking at social capital between 
bonding and bridging, right? So bonding, the reaching in social capital, bridging, reaching out. And I'm not sure how much you can get at those two different types of social capital with your measures, but I am wondering if you look at any interactions between the individual's perception of social capital with the, the broader town's perception of social capital. Because I'm curious if, if there's somebody who really feels like the social capital is low in this town, but the town generally feels like we, we have a tight knit thing. Is that kind of a, a, a depiction of maybe a kind of more of an exclusive nature of social capital? And do you, do you see these kind of interactions across uh, the level of analysis? I've never, I've never done that. I mean, it was certainly, you could do it, right? Because we, we could aggregate to the town level. And we've done a lot of work, not, not just me, it's been a ton of work where we aggregate at the town level for our analysis. But like you say, we do have individual level data too. It'd be interesting to take a look. I can't even remember off the top of my head, I'm sure I've looked at it, just what's the distribution of social capital in a town? I mean, is, it, is it relatively a flat distribution? Meaning there's quite a few people who feel that social capital is low in their town, uh, but and quite a few people feel it's high, or is it more of a tight distribution where it seems like the town functions more or less the same in terms of their uh, perception of social capital. Um, there's, I mean, that's just another one, another question you could look at. It's just, it's, it, it is truly an amazing database. Uh, all the more so because you can do a lot of things across time now. So you can take a look at the change in social capital for a 20 year period, uh, soon to be a 30 year period. Um, all right, I don't know if there's any other questions, um, but. Yeah. Oh, I, I, we really appreciate this. I actually have to, I have a hard stop in a minute, well, actually right now. So I have to say goodbye. Uh, not often I get this scheduled so tight with COVID, but I actually have something else <laughs> I, have to, I have to go to. Uh, so appreciate everybody jumping in. Uh, pleasure to share this with you and thanks for your comments.